Welcome to our wonderful uh, program for today, Beyond Kimchi, an introduction to Korean cooking. My name is Katrina Lacerna, and I'm the Asian Pacific Research Center Librarian for LA County Library. As Jose mentioned, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, if we don't address your question or comment right away during the program, um, please don't fret. We have a Q&A at the end of the event, so hopefully we can get to your question then. Um, and yes, today's program is going to be a wonderful one, an introduction to Korean cooking, and we have a local expert with us to discuss that topic, Ha Jung Cho. I'll introduce to you to her in just one moment, um, but just a little outline of what we'll be doing today. Ha Jung will be talking about the traditions of Korean cooking, and then she'll go ahead and demonstrate how to create some of these delicious dishes at home. Um, before we proceed, I did feel um, that we needed to make uh, a sort of statement, if um, you'll indulge me for a moment. Um, today, we're celebrating Korean culture, and it seems like it would be very inappropriate um, not to acknowledge the loss of four Korean lives earlier this week in the tragic Atlanta shootings. I know that we're all feeling a mess of emotions right now, from anger and sadness to a feeling of helplessness, and many of those in the Asian Pacific Islander community are scared and frightened. Um, I do take solace in the fact that all of us stand united, not just in our grief and our sense of loss, but also in solidarity against any kind of racism and violence. So if you are inclined to help or feel like you need help right now, we're going to be posting a link in the chat box. Um, it's going to have information about resources, not only for the AAPI community, but for anyone who feels like they're an ally. Um, if we'll include information on how to get mental health resources, um, if you need help reporting an incidence of bias or a hate crime, there's also links to anti-racism educational resources, as well as to petitions and volunteer opportunities. So I do hope that um, some of those resources will be helpful to you in this very trying time. Thank you. So today, again, we're going to be talking about Korean food culture. And we have a very, very lovely guest with us. Her name is Ha Jung Cho. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her before we begin, because she has a very impressive and um, very fascinating uh, resume. Okay, so um, Ha Jung started her career in nonprofit management and human rights. She made the switch to food and has been cooking professionally for over 15 years. Trained as a master food preserver in 2011, Ha Jung teaches kimchi making and other food preservation classes across the greater Los Angeles area. She's the secretary of the Culinary Historians of Southern California and is a gardener at the Crenshaw Community Garden. For more information, you can check out Haiji's Kimchi Club on Facebook. And with that, I'll hand over our proceedings to our wonderful guest of honor, Ha Jung Cho. Hello, Ha Jung. Uh oh. I see Ha Jung. Um, ha Jung, did you want to unmute yourself? Hi, everybody. Hi, Hajang. Hi. I'm so excited to join you and Katrina so much for inviting me today. Um, I am really excited to share uh, something about the breadth and depth of Korean cooking with you. Uh, are we having audio difficulty? I can hear you clearly. Okay, great. A uh, little bit of feedback, but um, yes, I can hear you, Hajung. I can go ahead and also put up your um, your PowerPoint right now. Yes, great. And if, if you mute yourself, it would. Okay. Um, so I know most of you are pretty familiar with Korean uh, food from because there are amazing Korean restaurants here in Los Angeles. But I wanted to talk more about really the breadth and depth of Korean food, some of the philosophy behind it, uh, how a Korean meal is structured, and give you a sense of more uh, home style food, what you know normal Koreans are eating day in and day out, not really the special foods like the barbecue that we eat in restaurants. 
So with that, let's just jump in and start. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and Katrina will be uh, monitoring that and can ask me questions during uh, the presentation. So let's go forward. Thank you. So uh, the there is a definite philosophy behind Korean food, and that is a balance. And I know that many of you know the term uh, yin yang, which is the balance of opposites like hot and cold, male, female, light and dark. The Korean version of yin yang is called um yang. And so the Korean food is based on this philosophy of balancing tastes, flavors, um, colors, uh, etc. So the five flavors are sweet, hot, sour, salty, and bitter. The five colors, or obansek, which literally means five colors, is red, yellow, green, black, and white. And the this idea of the the five things are is also represented in five materials, five organs of the body, five emotions, etc. And so while the average eater is not thinking about these things uh, while they're eating, you can see in the slides that I show today how the this philosophy is uh, represented in Korean food. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a photo of a typical Korean meal and here I wanted to say that a typical Korean meal is very differently structured than a Western meal. When I think of an American meal, I think of a big plate and you have at the center of your plate some kind of protein and then you probably have a starch and maybe some vegetables. So the center of your meal is kind of the protein. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you order a steak and then there are these side dishes. But in a Korean meal, the center of your meal is the rice or other uh, starch or grain that you eat. And then you also have a bowl of soup. And the soup is to balance the dryness of the rice. And then in the middle of the table, you have all these side dishes called banchan. And those could be meat or tofu, vegetables, eggs, seafood, uh, stews. But the focus of the meal is everybody's bowl of rice and bowl of soup. So you can see at the top and the bottom of this photo that there are four place settings. Everybody has their own bowl of rice, which is covered right now, and then a bowl of soup to the right. And uh, this is important because Koreans, they generally teach their children to be right-handed. And so everybody's soup is on the right and the rice is on the left. And this is because of a belief in, um, in ancestors. Um, Korea is a very Confucian country. And later when we see a photo about ancestor rite ceremonies, we'll see that for a person who has passed and is dead, the soup is on the left and the rice is on the right. So when you're eating a Korean meal, you should always have it the other way. Rice on the left, soup on the right. But um, if you're left-handed, it can be a little bit complicated. <laughs> so in this table, we can see there's a stew in the middle that's shared by everybody, unlike the soup, the individual soup that everybody has. And then there are a bunch of side dishes. Of course, this is a pretty fancy meal. Not every meal is gonna have this many side dishes but this is kind of typical of maybe a celebration, a birthday meal or something like that. Next slide. So let's talk about the main focus of the meal. The jushik is the main staple food here. In this photo, you can see the jushik, the rice. This is not white rice. This is probably uh, rice mixed with barley on the left and the way you're gonna eat this meal is by putting the rice into that big bowl of vegetables in the middle and then you're gonna season it with some uh, soybean paste that's in the little pot on the right. So the rice is on the left and there's also a soup further to the right and then the side dishes in front of you. So um, 
Koreans have been eating this way for thousands of years, although rice was not necessarily eaten at all meals by all people. White rice especially was very expensive. So let's move on to the next slide. So the juche can be white rice, and that's what you'll see in a lot of restaurants, but it could be a mixed rice. So this is a bowl of rice mixed with beans. It probably has some millet. It could have some sticky rice mixed in, and that makes it much healthier. So the irony, of course, is that only rich people could afford white rice, and poor people had to eat things like barley and beans um, mixed in with their rice or even sweet potatoes if they didn't have any rice. But now we know that all those things are much healthier for you, have a lower glycemic index, and it was only the rich people who were getting diabetes from eating white rice. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so chushik is not only rice, it could be also porridge. So porridge is made by adding a lot more water to rice and also adding vegetables or uh, meat, fish, seafood. Next. Next slide, please. Oh, let's go back one. So in addition to rice or porridge, let's go forward one. Jushik could also be noodles. And this is a picture of kalguksu or rice, or I'm sorry, knife cut noodles with clams. And you can see most noodles come with their own soup. So if you had porridge or noodles, you wouldn't have a bowl of soup to the right. Next slide. Uh, jushi could also mean dumplings and rice cakes. So this is uh, manduku uh, or taku, which is typically served on New Year's Day. The rice cakes are made into, into these long rods and then cut into these ovalettes. And so the, when they're in the rod, they're symbolizing long life. And so that's why you eat it as a lucky thing on New Year's Day. Um, the Korean dumplings that you can see in the left part of the bowl are called mandu. And so mandu actually came to Korea with the Mongols. So uh, there are a lot of words for dumplings that the Mongols, when they conquered Asia and into almost all the way into Europe, they uh, brought this dumpling idea to all these countries. And so uh, whether it's called mandu or um, something else, they all came from the Mongols. Next slide, please. Before we move on, Hudson, we had a question from JK. Are banchan served with every meal? Yes. Uh, banchan are served at every meal. If it's a very simple meal, probably the only banchan you would have is kimchi. But um, kimchi is probably the most important banchan. I heard a story from a friend. She said when her parents got married, her father said to her mother, don't worry about giving me lots of panchan. As long as there are three kimchi on the table, I'm happy. So that was his expectation. Only three kimchi. We can move on to the next slide or next question. Okay, so now let's move from talking about the jushik to the soup. So soup is also very important in a Korean meal. Um, I don't think soup is as important to Westerners as it is to uh, Koreans, but you always have in addition to your jushik some kind of soup. And the native Korean word for soup is guk. So this is uh, an example of a maldun guk or a clear broth soup. And so guk is always a very simple soup. It has a specific ratio of uh, three parts solids to seven part liquids. And uh, it is usually cooked and then served at the table and you don't add any condiments to it. And everybody gets their own bowl. Next slide. Uh, 
We did have a question from Laura. She asks, can you tell me how to share with others at my table from the shared dishes? Do I reach into the bowl with my own chopsticks? Yes, most of the panchan and the shared dishes, uh, everybody's putting their chopsticks into those shared bowls. Um, Koreans don't have as much of that uh, tradition like the Chinese do of putting the tasty bits, picking them out and putting them into your friend's or loved one's bowl. But Koreans will often move the panchan dishes so you can, um, you know, kind of pick one up and place them closer to somebody if you think, you know, they would enjoy that or if they're having difficulty getting to that dish. So that's very common. And yes, you could even pick a choice morsel and put it into somebody else's bowl. Uh, rice bowl, that is. Next slide. So here's an example of another kind of kuk. Tojang uh, kuk is made with denjang, which is the Korean version of what we call miso, and also the uh, wash, the rinse water from washing rice. So that makes a kind of a slightly thicker soup and salty from the denjang. And then that's cooked with vegetables, obviously. So that's a very common preparation with lots of different kinds of vegetables. Next slide. Here we have a uh, gongguk, or sometimes it's called gom tang. So gom means beef. So these soups are made with boiled beef parts, including lots of bones. So Koreans are famous for salong tang. Um, and so when you boil the bones for that long, it, the broth comes out sometimes milky um, from the long uh, boiled. And also, this is often called gongtang and not gongguk. Guk is the Korean traditional or native word for soup. Tang is a Chinese derived word. And uh, there's a difference between a guk and a tang. If there's a difference, it's that a tang is usually cooked for a longer period of time, like the beef bone broths are. And a tang sometimes will come to the table unseasoned, and then you add seasonings to the soup, like the green onions, the salt on the side. So a tang will come with zero salt, and you add salt to taste at the table. Next slide. Uh, and this is a, a slightly uncommon uh, kind of soup, but this is nenguk or cold soup. So this is very refreshing in the summertime when it's really super hot. You take, you know, ripe cucumbers and you make this kind of iced soup, kind of like a, the soup version of Gatorade, really. Next slide. Now I want to stop for a moment and talk about jang. It's not a part of the meal, but it's usually the seasonings that go into all different uh, dishes in the meal. So jang are the foundational seasonings of Korean cooking. You can see here, these ladies are working with these ongi, these huge earthenware pots full of denjang. So denjang is uh, the Korean version of what we call miso in America. Uh, but denjang is not made exactly in the same way that miso is made. The soybeans are cooked. They're pressed into these bricks. They uh, undergo a fermentation process and a drying process. And it takes several months. So uh, this denjang is used in soups, but it's used also to flavor banchans. Um, and it's a very typical, uh, very common. In fact, denjang soup, I think, is the most common soup in a Korean family and, and a favorite of children as well. So also, I want to uh, give a note about these earthenware pots. These ongi are also used to store kimchi over the winter, although the pots are dug into the ground. And this is a great technology where the pots have been glazed so that, you know, the liquid and everything stays in, but they breathe. 
to allow the fermentation to happen in an optimal way. So it's a great tradition that is unfortunately the hand making of these is kind of dying out. Okay, next slide, please. Another jang is gochujang. Gochu means pepper in Korean. So this is a pepper paste that's used very frequently in Korean dishes. Um, of course, the gochu, the peppers, did not come to Korea until after 1500 from uh, the Western Hemisphere, probably brought by uh, Portuguese traders. But for some reason, uh, these uh, Western Hemisphere chilies became super popular and Koreans started incorporating them into their kimchi, making gochujang and putting them in almost all their dishes. Next slide. Uh, the ne this next slide shows ganjang, which is what we would call soy sauce. This is a Korean ganjang is kind of a byproduct of making denjang. And so Korean denjang and ganjang are actually both gluten-free. There's no, traditionally, no wheat added. Okay, next slide. And this is not a jang, but this is also a, a, a kind of seasoning that Koreans use in cooking that I think is maybe would be unusual to Westerners. So as you can see, this is a photo of a, of an open air market in Yasu, my parents' hometown in the southern part of Korea. And here, this shop is selling pretty much only chapkal, which are the salted and preserved seafoods. So it could be little tiny fish, it could be anchovies or other kinds of seafood. So you can see they're not refrigerated, they've all been preserved with salt and you just go and say, give me half a kilo of the, the baby shrimp or a kilo of this or that, and they'll put it into a container for you to take home. Uh, so these jungs, the um, denjang, the uh, red pepper paste, the ganjang or, or soy sauce, the jokbal, along with the sesame seed oil and sesame seeds form really the basic ingredients of Korean seasonings along with salt. Next. Okay, so now we get to the fun part, the panchan. So when I go to a Korean restaurant, you know, a lot of people ask me, what's your favorite barbecue restaurant? And I tell them I don't have one because I don't go to Korean restaurants to eat barbecue. I go to Korean restaurants to eat panchan. And so my favorite restaurants are the restaurants that give you lots of different home style panchan. I am not talking the, uh, you know, little slices of steamed broccoli that have no love in them. I'm talking traditional panchan that your grandmother would make. So I just wanted to show you this photo. This is a Korean table or papsan that has been set uh, with all the panchan, all the shared dishes, and this is before the rice and the soup come. Usually when you set the table, you put all the shared dishes out and then you put out the rice and soup because you want them to be as hot as possible when people start eating. And this was um, a family dinner that we had with my mother's best friend from elementary school. She cooked these fabulous dishes for us when we visited Yasu a few years ago. Next slide, please. I think we did have some questions, some pepper questions. Okay. From David. from David, David asks, is gochu a particular variety of chili pepper, like a cayenne versus a Thai chili? Yes, yes. it is. I am sorry that I do not know the botanical name of the Korean gochu. I do know that you can order Korean chili seeds if you want to grow uh, gochu in your garden from Kitazawa Seed Company. Um, Koreans basically have only two kinds of chili peppers that they adopted from uh, these Portuguese traders. One is the, the green chili that's about this big. It looks, it's more pointy like a serrano, but bigger than that, about the size of a jalapeno, but pointy like a serrano. And um, 
those we can eat green like that, just dip it into some jang and then eat it at the table, or they will let them ripen and get red in the fields. And then the red ones are then dried whole and then ground up to make kochukaru, the uh, chili flakes that we use for making kimchi and cooking. Uh, there's also a kind of chili called uh, twisted chili, which um, is more wrinkled. And uh, I think it, maybe people will know it better as uh, from the Japanese name. Um, I'm blanking on the Japanese name, but you've had it as a as a as a dish in Japanese restaurants as little twisted chilies, which are usually not that hot. But uh, Koreans don't have a huge variety of chilies. It's the main gochu and then the little twisted ones. Okay. Any other questions? It looks like you, Lydia's question. She was wondering if the peppers were uh, Portuguese in origin. And also people were wondering, is it the shishito pepper that you were hoping? Is, is that the correct name? Yes. I think we call them shishito peppers. To me, they don't look exactly the same, but maybe it's a variety of shishito that is grown in Korea. And yes, they're very similar. They're kind of twisted and small, and you eat them as their own side dish. Uh, usually, they're not the ones that are used in cooking. Um, I had a bunch of questions about banchan. People are very curious. Um, why asks... Oh, sorry, we're getting lots of comments. Um, they're wondering how... When you do make the, oh, I'm sorry, the chat keeps, <laughs> lots of the comments are coming in now. Okay. Uh, are banchan made the same day for the meal or is there a supply? Like food prep, do you mix and match throughout the week's meals? Yes. So if we go to the next slide, I can talk about this more. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, we, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but uh, I'll talk about this at the next slide. Let me talk about kimchi first a little bit. Um, so kimchi is the most important panchan, and it is really the national dish of Korea. It is uh, fermented vegetables, and basically Koreans got this idea of using salt to ferment their vegetables from the Chinese hundreds of years ago but then they added their own flair to it. So at first kimchi wasn't even called kimchi, it was just called ji or other names. And then eventually Koreans started adding their flavoring ingredients of ginger, garlic, and uh, onion to it. So you can think of kimchi as kind of sauerkraut with ginger, garlic, and onion. And that's the typical flavor profile. So um, there are a ton of different kimchis, uh, and we can go through some of the popular ones here. On the top left is oisobegi, or cucumber kimchi. That's very popular in the summertime. That's not a long fermented variety. You make it, you eat it in the next you know, week or to two weeks. Next to the cucumber kimchi, it looks like there's um, pagimchi, which is a green onion or scallion kimchi. Next to that on the right is pek kimchi, which means white kimchi. So this is what kimchi looked like before the Portuguese brought the, the Western Hemisphere chilies. It was white. Um, this Napa cabbage actually came from China in around the 1400s. So uh, before that, if you look underneath, a lot of kimchi was made with radishes. So this uh, other white kimchi in the middle is called dongchimi, which means winter kimchi. You would take whole or quartered um, Korean radishes and you would put them in a, in a uh, brine and they would ferment over a long period of time in the winter. And then you would take the pieces out, cut it into bite-sized pieces, and then drink the probiotic broth as well as eating the crunchy vegetables. And this is also really delicious when you're eating barbecue to have something kind of um, sour, tangy, cold when you're eating this greasy hot meat. 
in the middle of the photo, we have uh, Getsu Kimchi, which is the most popular kimchi now. But really, Getsu Kimchi, you know, was not popular because Koreans didn't have the Chinese or the Napa cabbage 400 years ago. Um, but it is the most popular kimchi now, and it's the kimchi that Koreans make in late October, early November in that uh, cultural event called Kimjang, which is like a barn raising for making kimchi. Uh, on the left of that, I think, is a puchu kimchi, which is a chive kimchi that would be popular in the spring when the first chives are growing. Underneath that is probably the second most popular kimchi in Korea is gakdugi, which are the Korean radishes cut into cubes. And it's very crunchy. It's usually not that spicy. It can be a little bit sweet from the sweet radishes. Next to the gakdugi, we see um, kimchi that is a uh, typical to the Seoul region because I think it was more of a royal court kimchi. It's called posam kimchi. Posam means to wrap. So they've taken a Napa cabbage and made it into this big kind of flower shape with all the other kimchi ingredients inside. This kimchi could also incorporate raw oysters, which would be kind of a fancy thing to add to your kimchi. And the last kimchi on the bottom right is chonga kimchi, which are these kind of baby radishes that still have their long um, uh, stems and leaves on it. And uh, chonga in Korea, chonga was a bachelor. And the bachelors, before they got married, they would wear their hair in a ponytail. So this is a ponytail radish kimchi. So very crunchy, actually one of my favorite kimchis. Um, so kimchi, as you can see, it's hugely important in Korean culture. You eat kimchi for all meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, unless you're eating a Western meal. And uh, Koreans, you know, an adult can eat maybe a quarter to half a cup of kimchi every day. So next slide, please. Oh, we did have a question from Patricia. She was wondering if I don't want to make kimchi, is there a brand that you recommend or that you like? I knew you were going to ask that. Um, yes, if you don't make your own kimchi, but you would like to eat kimchi because it's delicious and it has wonderful health benefits. Um, if you go to some of the Korean markets here in LA, uh, my mother has a favorite brand of kimchi. It's called Oshine, which means the O family. Oshine, although they spell it in a weird way, O-C-I-N-E-T, Oshine kimchi, and they make, uh, the kind that my mother gets is the uh, ma kimchi, which is the Napa cabbage kimchi that's already been all cut up. And she likes it because it's not too spicy. Um, when it ferments, she still, she, she doesn't like super sour kimchi, so she likes it when it's kind of fresh. And so when she buys it, she eats it when it's kind of fresh. And then as it gets more and more sour, my sister and I like the more sour kimchi. So then she can give it to us. Or when it gets super sour, that's when we start cooking with kimchi. So that's when we would make the kimchi jjigae, kimchi stew, kimchi pancakes. You could put it into dumplings, etc. So um, uh, I have also heard recently of a brand from the from Northern California called uh, Sangdungi kimchi, twins kimchi that is organic. I have not personally tried it, but I have heard good things about it. And people just wanted, uh, can you spell that kimchi brand that your mom loves so much again? <laughs> people yes. are jotting it it's down. Oshine, and it's spelled O-C-I-N-E-T, but you pronounce it Oshine, and it means from the O family, Oshine. Um, o C I N E T. And it's available at most of the supermarkets in Koreatown, not all of them. Um, I would also recommend buying, if you want uh, good kimchi, don't buy the one that's made at the supermarket. Those are usually made very cheaply and uh, they're usually not fermented, so you would have to take it home and wait a couple of weeks for it to be fermented. Uh, I prefer to buy brands from Korea 
in the vacuum sealed bags, those, you know, I think are made with good ingredients and the, the vacuum sealing. And usually by the time they get here from Korea, they're already fermented. So they're good to eat right away. Um, there's a, uh, an agricultural cooperative in Korea that sells those kind of vacuum sealed kimchi. And I, I like that brand. So we can move on or I can take other questions. Okay, so now we get to the meat banchan. Meat means underneath. So these are your base panchans. And this is going back to that other viewer's question. Panchan are a combination of things that you make like the kimchi and these meat panchan that are preserved and will last a long time. So you make a big batch of kimchi and then you eat it for months. Or uh, some of these things in this photo, you make a big batch of it and then you store it in your fridge and you take out a little bit every day. You don't put it back in, you keep it separate. And so these form the base of your meal. And then on top of that, you make fresh rice, you make fresh vegetables, the namals that we'll talk about later, and maybe a soup or a stew. And that will be your meal. So you don't have to make all of these every day. About half of them you've already made during meal prep at, a, at another time. So uh, these meat banchan are usually more of uh, some kind of preserved thing that you season like on the top left, this is like dried squid uh, juliennes that you then kind of stir fry in um, the gochujang and you know you add something sweet and sesame seeds, sesame oil, et cetera. In the middle, we have um, a way of preserving meat. You stew these um, like stew cuts of meat for a long time in uh, soy sauce and other garlic, other seasonings. And those are quail eggs next to them. And then this, these salty meat pieces you shred, but you can keep them in the fridge for you know several weeks and it's still fine. Next to that are um, these little tiny dried anchovies that you also stir fry. Uh, so they're kind of crunchy, crisp, salty, sweet. Underneath that are uh, black beans that have been first boiled and then seasoned also with soy sauce, um, uh, some kind of sweetener, sesame seed oil, etc. In the middle, we have uh, lotus flower roots or stems, yungun, and those have been also stir fried in a similar way. And on the left bottom, I think those are sweet potato stems. So Koreans are really you know, before it was popular, Koreans were into eating nose to tail in vegetables as well as meats. So we not only eat the sweet potato tubers, we also eat the sweet potato stems, the sweet potato leaves, um, Koreans forage in the mountains for wild vegetables. And, uh, you know, many Koreans are have that experience of foraging in the mountains or um, so, you know, this uh, kind of popular thing about nose to tail, you know, Koreans were on that thousands of years ago. Korea is a very mountainous country. It's about 78% mountains. So there are lots of mountains to forage in. We can go to the next slide or a question. <laughs> But you know, we had a question from Amir going back to Korean rice. What is it called? Is it sticky rice? What type of rice is it? Koreans eat that kind of uh, what maybe, you know, we would know as sushi rice here. It's a short grain kind of fat white rice that, and it does tend to stick together when it's cooked, but it's not sticky rice per se. It's not sweet rice that is, you know, typically called sticky rice. Although Koreans do use it for making um, their rice cakes or mixing with the regular rice and beans and other things to make the more healthy mixed rice. Another rice question. Uh, it seems to be a topic <laughs> popular with a lot of people. Jennifer asks, how do you make purple rice? Oh, okay. 
So the rice is not purple. When you buy it, it will say black rice. And it is longer and skinnier than the white rice, but it's not as long as the, uh, the North American wild rice. But it is, yeah, in Korean markets, it will be called black rice. But when it's mixed, so you just put a little tiny bit of it in with the white rice and it makes the white rice purple. And, but yes, it, the anthocyanins in the black rice make it very healthy. So it's, it's much better when you make rice to mix it with the black rice, the beans, the millet, the barley, you'll get m m many more nutrients that way. And, and I think it's tastier as well. We also have a kimchi question from Glenn. Is the well-fermented kimchi the one when you open the jar, it bubbles? Yes, in the fermentation process, the, uh, the bacteria, the good bacteria, the lactobacillus, are eating the carbohydrates in the vegetables, like the Napa cabbage, and it's creating um, lactic acid, which is the sour flavor, and also the carbon dioxide, which is why it bubbles. And sometimes when you when you eat kimchi, you feel this kind of almost alive, effervescent feeling, and and that is from the fact that it is a living, fermenting um, type of food. So. Uh, one way you can tell when you're buying kimchi in the supermarket, whether the kimchi is fresh or more fermented, is the color. When you make fresh kimchi, it will be kind of a darker red from the uh, chili flakes, but the vegetables will still look opaque and white. Later on, when it's fermented, the color of the kimchi turns to a lighter, more orangey red, and the vegetables will start looking a little bit translucent. And, and sometimes you can also see, also see bubbles in the jar. You know, I, I personally um, don't buy kimchi that much, but kimchi has this lifespan. You can think of it as a um, bell curve. You know, in the beginning, it's not that fermented, not that sour. And then as it ferments, more and more of the lactobacillus are growing and you get more of the sour flavor and more of that kind of alive feeling. And then eventually, even though the lactobacillus is great at creating this environment that they thrive in and other bad bacteria and yeast don't thrive in, eventually the pH gets so um, low that they don't even like that super sour environment and they start to die off. And when your kimchi gets old, you might still love the taste of it, but eventually the, um, the living probiotics will kind of die down. And when it gets super old and super sour, that's when Koreans will start to cook with it. And so, you know, you don't care so much about killing the probiotics by boiling it because they've already kind of died down. Other questions? We had another kimchi uh, related question from Hannah. I believe if you're, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. This is from Jill. Can you add more cabbage to your kimchi as the cabbage is gone, but there is still paste? Uh, well, you could, but you would have to brine the cabbage first because the fermentation is not going to happen unless you introduce some salt to the vegetables and that initial addition of the salt is protecting the vegetables from getting eaten by other bad bacteria, yeast and molds, and allowing time for the good bacteria to start growing. So you need to brine it, and then you could add it. Um, the flavor is not going to be the same as the first batch because it will have been kind of uh, diluted, but you could try it. Definitely. One time I, um, a friend of mine took my kimchi making class and he took home this jar of kimchi and his mom was very excited and heard about it. And she said, let me come right over and see this kimchi that you made. She, you know, she was kind of so shocked that her son had made kimchi. But my family is from the south of Korea, which is hotter. And you need to add more salt, more chili pepper, more of these um kind of antibiotic ingredients, you know, to make your kimchi stay good longer. She is from Seoul, which is more north, and they're known for 
less spicy, less salty kimchi. So when he took the kimchi to his house, his mom tasted it and said, oh, no, too spicy, too salty. So she got another Napa cabbage that she had. She brined it and she combined the two. So it was two jars of kimchi and it was, you know, good according to her sense of soul, sense of, of kimchi flavor. And we do have another kimchi question, um, possibly a food safety related question. Does kimchi ever go bad? Should it not be eaten at all? Okay, I ever I knew people were going to ask this question, and I was going to answer it during the cooking demo part. But here, if you can see it now, uh, here is a, a jar of kimchi that's been in my fridge for over a year. And uh, of course, it started out in a much bigger jar, but when I only had this much left, I put it into this small jar. Uh, this kimchi, it's definitely over a year old, and I'm using it for my kimchi pancakes. Your kimchi will probably not go bad in the sense that you can't eat it unless you introduce some bad bacteria, yeast, or mold. So for example, when you're taking kimchi out of your jar, use clean utensils. And then if you have this bowl of half-eaten kimchi, don't put it back in the jar. Store that separately. Push everything else down underneath the liquid. Everything under the liquid is in an anaerobic environment where the fermentation happens, and it is not in danger of getting attacked by bad yeasts, molds, bacteria. Uh, when If you open your jar of kimchi and you see something white or black or pink or you know whatever growing at the top on the edge of your jar where the air meets the kimchi that's because you have somehow introduced some bacteria into it um if i were you i would take out the bad bits and keep eating the good kimchi or if you have immunocompromised people in your family just throw it out but if you make kimchi at home and store it in our super efficient refrigerators that we have nowadays, your kimchi will be good for at least six months, usually more than a year. Uh, if you're storing kimchi outside, it really depends on the weather conditions. In the summertime, the Koreans used to sometimes put their kimchi inside a stream to keep it cooler so it would last longer. Um, but unless you're seeing some mold growing on the edge, I would say your kimchi is probably good. It will change in, in terms of taste and flavor profile over time. It will get more sour. Um, but some people like the fresh kimchi. Some people like the sour kimchi. Um, it's, it's really up to you. So to uh, really answer your question, don't be worried that your kimchi that's you know three months old is going to kill you. In North America or in America, we really have never had a case of food poisoning or foodborne illness from fermented vegetables. We have had cases from fermented proteins, not fermented vegetables. It's really, you know, this ferment, lactal fermentation is nature's way of helping us get vitamins and minerals and preserving our food for longer. Um, so, yeah. Can we move to the next slide or another question? We can move on to the next slide, Hedjo. <laughs> okay, great. So now we finally get to the namul, and I know some people have been waiting for this. So namul are cooked vegetables. They're either fresh or um, dried vegetables that have been cooked and seasoned. So here in the front, we have the uh, shigumchi namu, which is a spinach, with one of the most common namus that you eat at home. Behind it, the brown stuff is fern break or bracken. It's like kind of a fiddlehead fern. It grows in the mountains like this, and then you can go pick it. And then you, a lot of times, it's uh, either dehydrated and sold dr either dry or reconstituted, and then you cook it and season it. That's one of my favorite side dishes. And the, the whiter um, vegetable there is toraji, which is called bellflower or Chinese um, 
bellflower. It is a flower that grows in Korea and we eat the roots and you have to uh, let it sit in salty water to pull out the bitterness. Koreans are really into bitter things. The Koreans are really into this idea that food is medicine and they feel that any foods that are bitter are really healthy for you. And I know in America, Americans are really not into bitter foods, but in Korea, there are a lot of bitter things that, you know, Koreans say, oh, this is so good for you. Drink this, eat this. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So, so namul are different from sengche. Sengche means basically raw vegetables. So kind of a salad, a salad that you season with these different seasonings with your hands. This is a sengche made from onions and uh, buchu, the Korean uh, kind of garlic chives. Next slide. And this is a, a muchin. Muchida means to season something with your hands. So. Uh, a lot of Korean dishes are made this way. They're seasoned. You cook it separately and then you season it in a bowl with your hands. And this is where this Korean idea of sonmat comes in. Sonmat literally means hand taste. So people feel that the, the taste of the food is in the hand of the cook. So uh, if you are a good cook, you have really good sonma. Your, your hand knows how many of which ingredient to put in or how much of what to add to make it tasty. This is kolbengi muchim, which is an anju or a drinking food that you can order in restaurants. Kolbengi are these kind of sea snail things that you can buy in cans or fresh in Korea. And then it's mixed with cucumbers and other vegetables and then seasoned with gochujang and eaten with noodles. And Koreans never drink without some kind of food, some anju. So <coughs> you might find this funny to eat sea snails with your beer, but Koreans feel it's completely necessary to eat interesting foods with your drinks. Next slide. Another category of Korean uh, banchan or dishes are chin, steamed or braised dishes. So this is a steamed end dish that would be, you know, eaten communally. There are also like uh, braised fish dishes with long cooked radish. Um, traditionally, although when you go to a Korean restaurant, you are most uh, familiar with the grilled dishes, Grilling wasn't something that people did a lot at home. They had a, uh, you know, my parents grew up living in houses where they uh, burnt wood for, fire, for heat and for cooking. And so you could boil or steam things. You uh, cooked rice that way. Uh, people didn't necessarily grill at home. Next slide. So before we move on, Hajung, we had a question from Megan. What is the red garnish in this dish? She's wondering. This is uh, called shilgochu or thread chilies. So uh, the chilies are dried and then cut into these very thin threads and used in certain dishes really just as garnish. You never, um, yeah, they use it for garnish. It's not really an integral part of the dish. Next slide. Okay, so here is a jorin. It's a braised dish, and this is probably undegu jorin at a restaurant. Undegu means black cod, or I think we call it, um, or actually it means silver cod, but in English we call it black cod. And this is a dish that was made famous here in LA because undegu, this black cod, is not something that we have in Korea. It's something that is caught here off the west coast of North America, but it's delicious. And you cook these uh, radishes for a long time and they pick up the seasoning and they're sweet and yummy. Next slide. 
Okay. This, so we finally come to gui, grilled dishes. So I usually when we think of Korean grilled things, we think of kalbi, the ribs, or um, the other thinly sliced meat. Uh, and those are technically, it's not just kalbi, it's kalbi gui, grilled ribs. And this is a uh, grilled fish. So that's another whole category of Korean dishes. Next. And we also have chun or puchinge, pan fried things. So um, this is another category of things that you could do over a, you know, a wood fire. Um, chun are often, or puchinge, these fried pancakes are often made, my mother told me, uh, on a rainy day because when everybody was farmers, the only time your mom had time to make all these pancakes over and over frying was when it was rainy and the farmers couldn't work out in the fields. That might be a day when the children would ask their mom to make these, these pan fried pancakes as a snack. Next slide. Uh, so the puchinge are those vegetable pancakes. This is an example of a jun. So these are um, kind of zucchini type, um, zucchini type uh, squash that have been sliced and then dipped in flour and egg and then fried. This is a very typical uh, panchan, something you might see in a kid's lunchbox. Next. Next slide, okay. These are also very, oops, let's go back. This is also a very typical, uh, this is a plate of two kinds of chun. Um, if we go back one, the, on the top are uh, fried fish, white fish pieces, and on the bottom are what are called dongrang thing or little round things. And those are kind of, kind of like a dumpling filling that you then make in a little round and fry. Um, next. And then there's a category of actually deep fried things. These are fried vegetables like onions, carrots, uh, sweet potato. And I remember my mom making these for parties when we were little children. But of course, you know, at home, you tend to not deep fry things unless it's a special occasion. Next. Next slide. OK. Now we get to stews. So a chige is different from a soup, a group, in that the they're more solid things. So it's a ratio of about six solids to four liquids. And so this would be served in the middle of the table. Usually families just all dip their spoons into it and eat it communally. This looks like a kimchi jjigae, which is what you can do with kimchi when it's old. You make it into a stew with pieces of meat and tofu and vegetables. Um, so this is a common thing that you can order at Korean restaurants as well. And sometimes a jjigae is uh, given for free at a barbecue restaurant when you order the barbecue meat. Next. Question about the side. Joelle asks the deep fried fish and veggies, what kind of flour are they dipped in? She's hoping it's rice flour. Um, it is usually wheat flour, but you could certainly use rice flour or um, cornstarch or potato flour. My husband can't eat glutinous things, so I make so today I'm gonna to make these uh, kimchi pancakes with gluten-free flour. So yes, you can use rice flour. We also had a question from Hannah. She was wondering what kind of oil uh, is typically used in Korean cooking? Is there a range of oils used based on geographic location or economic status? Uh, the, the toasted sesame oil that I'm gonna to use today is mostly for flavoring. You wouldn't really use that for cooking. And so most Korean food is made with some kind of vegetable oil. You know, it might be peanut oil. It might be a combination of other oils. I don't think um, Koreans and Koreans, 
uh, don't cook with olive oil because that's not native to Asia. So um, yeah, just any kind of kind of not strongly flavored vegetable oil is fine. And then sesame oil for flavoring. Next. Okay, so here we come back to tang. These, um, these tangs are oftentimes you can order a, these uh, long boiled uh, soups in a restaurant as your main meal and rice will come with it. And then you could put some of the rice into the soup and eat it that way. And this you can see has the little cooked egg juliennes on top. And then oftentimes you add your own onions salt and even uh, chili seasoning or paste. Next slide. Okay, uh, this is a different kind of st stew called jungle. It usually has different vegetables, seafood, noodles, tofu, uh, and we might call it hot pot, but it's not like Chinese hot pot. You don't add other ingredients while you're at the table. It usually comes all prepared to the table and it just boils there. Um, and that's kind of a festive meal or a, a main dish, if you will. Next. Jen, we did have a question that was asked a few times, and you did mention your um, husband can't eat gluten. Someone is just wondering, is it possible to make gluten-free dumplings? Um, I have not. Although my husband and I did have gluten-free dumplings at a Chinese place downtown, I have not really tried to make gluten-free dumplings. Um if you go to Chinese dim sum, of course, there are all those dumplings with the rice uh, wrappers that you could eat. Um, my husband can also eat long kind of um, sour like sourdough breads that have had a long fermentation where maybe, you know, sitting overnight in the fridge helps the, the big um, gluten molecules to be broken down. But I uh, I'm sorry, I have not discovered a way to make dumplings more gluten friendly. And some people are wondering, can you um, name drop that uh, restaurant in Chinatown for the gluten free dumplings? Uh, I don't know if it's still there, James, could you look it up? Uh, I think we went there for cocktails. Um, I'll see if my husband can, can remember that place. And we can move on. Okay, special occasion foods. So um, a lot of the foods that you see at Korean restaurants are special occasion foods. So this is chapche. It's a dish of uh, sweet potato noodles with vegetables and meat. And this is the kind of thing your mom would make for uh, you know, a party. Um, also the jun would be served at parties, the fr little fried things. Um, when somehow in the maybe late 60s, early 70s, uh, that kind of uh, potato salad with egg and maybe apple, that started to be served at Korean parties. I don't know why, I think it's a Western thing <laughs> uh, that came through Japan. But anyway, of course, there are special occasion foods. And next slide. Uh, Koreans also eat raw meat. And here you can see in this photo in the middle and to the left. Uh, when Koreans say it means raw fish. When uh, they want to talk about raw beef, they call it yukwe or, you know, beef raw meat. So um, these are also, you know, hue is a you know fancy, expensive thing. Usually at a lot of Korean restaurants, you can choose a fish and they'll cut it up and, you know, have these beautiful displays of the sashimi. And then they take the head and the bones and they'll make a jjigae, a stew with the rest of the fish that is served later. Next. I wanted to talk also about uh, chesa. 
So Korean, Korea is a very Confucian culture. And so on the anniversary of your, um, your elders death or on the anniversary of their birthday, you would do this thing called jesa, where you prepare all these different foods and there are, you know, a significance. You have a certain number of fruits, a certain number of fish, a certain number of vegetables. And then uh, if you can see in the way back, there's a setting of rice and soup, and you can see a, um, a piece of paper that has the name of the dead person written on it. And so that a uh, piece of paper is representing the dead ancestor who is coming back to visit you at midnight on the anniversary of their birth or death. And so the the rice and the soup are from their perspective is, you know, it's a opposite from ours as living people. And then uh, in the very front, there might be some incense that is burned, and then all the younger family members bow two and a half times. So bow two and a half times, two times to the ground, and then a half bow to honor the dead person. So you all get together. It's late at night, and you you know honor the ancestors, and then and there's also usually some alcohol that's served to them. And then, and also the rice and soup and all the food that is served to them. And then afterwards, everybody in the family eats together, talks about the dead ancestors, you know, share stories. And then obviously a lot of this food is shared and taken home by people. Um, and um, some people, a lot of people still do this. Sometimes for Chesa, you go to the grave site to do the ceremony. Um, you know, I saw a TV show one time where a woman was visiting her father's grave and her father really enjoyed hamburgers in life. So she brought a hamburger to the graveside and served it to him. Okay, next. I just wanted to um, make a note about court food. I think a lot of you might have seen that Korean um, show Daejanggum about the first Korean woman physician and how she rose up in the ranks as a court cook. So court food was very um, complicated. It obviously considered all these things like the obansek, all the different colors, the tastes, the organs. Um, at court, five meals a day were served, three main meals and then two kind of snacks. And uh, the surasang or the three tables that were served at court included two kinds of rice, two soups, two stews or chiges, one chim or steamed dish, one jonggol or hot pot, um, three kimchi, three jangs or sauces, and 12 chop or 12 side dishes. So it was a very involved, intense kind of thing, uh, and and you know imbued with all the symbolism. So if you want to try some court food, there is a restaurant um, here called um, Yongsusan that has some court food. A lot of people go there for family events because it's kind of fancy food. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then this other idea that Koreans have that the food is medicine, there are actually um, foods that are considered medicine and uh, they're used to restore your chi or your, or in Korean ki, your life energy. So in the summertime, you would eat this, this uh, whole chicken soup, it's called, um, Samgetang, which means three seasons soup. So uh, especially in the summertime when your ghee might be low, you eat the soup because it has ginseng, it has uh, garlic, it has uh, ginger, and these jujubes, all these things to increase your ki. Other uh, examples of poyakshik uh, would be ginseng, chicken, black goat, um, abalone, eel, carp, beef bone soup, pig intestine. And although, you know, I did not like to admit it as a child, this uh, dog soup or dog stew is considered boyakshik. So when my aunt had an operation 
in Korea. She was staying with her sister and um, they went especially to the market, bought dog meat and brought it home and cooked it for her. She was the only one who ate it because she was recovering. And dog meat is supposed to be very soft and easy to digest for invalids. Anyway, uh, let's... Oh, and uh, lastly, I wanted to talk... I didn't put a slide in. Koreans don't really eat dessert, but as you saw in the slide about the ancestor ceremonies, the jessa, Koreans tend to eat fruit after a meal and uh, as snacks, they might eat sometimes rice cakes. There were rice cakes in that photo, uh, but Koreans don't generally have a, you know, special dessert dishes other than the rice cakes, fruit. Um, there are special court sweets, but you know, not eaten very commonly by Koreans. I want to get to the... Um, if, if we could stop the sharing, and I want to get to the, uh, can you see? Yes, we can see your setup, I can. Okay, great. So I started cutting up the uh, cucumbers for our, I'm making mu senche, which is a cucumber salad. Um, and, in the recipe that Katrina is sharing with you, you can use one Korean cucumber, two Kirby's, or today I'm using three Persian cucumbers because that's what I had. And it's important to cut off the, the ends of both because there's an enzyme in the flowering end that will make your cucumber soft. And so if you have a hard time figuring out which one is the flowering end and which one is the stem end. Just cut both ends off. Slice your cucumbers. You can slice them thin or chunky. And then just put them into a bowl with a teaspoon of salt. And here we go. And let it sit for 15 minutes. After that, we're going to drain off the salty water. So you're not actually going to eat all this salt, but by getting some of the water out of the cucumber, you're going to end up with a crunchier dish because some of the water will come out. Okay. And then, so you're going to let that sit for 15 minutes. So let's make the rest of the seasoning. So we're going to season this, uh, cucumber salad with a green onion and uh, you need about a teaspoon of green onion so I'm just doing one and um, if you don't have green onion you could maybe cut some slices of regular white onion um, and if you uh, there are many ways to make this dish some people use soy sauce I don't like that so I'm not using soy sauce today in addition to our green onion, the recipe says a tablespoon, but I'm just going to add a teaspoon of the red Korean uh, pepper flakes. And as you can see there, the seeds have mostly been removed. It's just the dried skin of the red chili. It looks kind of like Aleppo pepper, and it's about the same spice level. It's not as hot as cayenne, but in general, the Korean chili powders they don't have mild medium and spicy so you just have to buy it and taste it and see how spicy it is i like to buy the brands that are from korea um if there were no korean ones i would buy the ones grown in mexico more uh before i bought a chinese brand just because i'm uh you know their uh, food practices are a little bit suspect we're also going to add a teaspoon of sesame seeds. These seeds are sometimes called uh, gesogum, which means sesame salt. It's because sesame is used as a seasoning. So they come uh, toasted and then um, ground or kind of pounded. So that's what I did. 
actually, I took the toasted one and I retoasted it at home because it tastes better that way. And then I put it in my little uh, mortar and you ground it, grind it, and you get this lovely nutty flavor. So then we're gonna add also half a teaspoon of salt, of sugar, I'm sorry, half a teaspoon of sugar and a teaspoon of white vinegar. You can use the rice vinegar or some other kind of vinegar. You could use apple um, cider vinegar. We're also gonna add a teaspoon of sesame oil and also a little bit of garlic. And you want about half a teaspoon of garlic. I have one garlic clove and you can mince it like you usually would, or this is how Korean housewives, because in all Korean food, generally when you're using garlic, you're pounding. So the Korean housewives are always pounding their garlic with the back of their knife, the handle. So here I go. I'm just gonna cut off that little bit. Okay, so then I'm gonna put away the, so you can see this is what the seasoning looks like. And this is all approximate because how big your cucumbers are determine how much seasoning you need. So we're gonna wait a few minutes and then finish the dish while I make our Korean uh, kimchi pancakes. So. Here, here I have uh, a quarter cup of kimchi that I took out of this jar and I chopped it into finer pieces. I'm also gonna, so this is my gluten-free flour mix that I have previously made. Um, but yeah, you can use, a combination of rice flour, brown rice flour. I'm going to put three quarter cups in here. And, you know, this doesn't have to be very exact. So, and to that, I'm going to add, here's a quarter cup of water in here. And to that, I'm going to add another quarter cup of the kimchi juice. Kimchi liquid, okay, that I got from my kimchi. And I'm also going to add a little bit of sugar to this. Um, here we go like maybe a quarter teaspoon, you know, to taste. The salt from the kimchi will be enough for the pancakes. And so to this salt, tiny bit of sugar, I'll add the liquid. I'll whisk that together. And and then I'll add the kimchi solids. I'm doing that. And I'll stir that together. So it should be maybe a little bit thicker than uh, a pancake batter. It can be a little bit more liquid than this, I think. James, could you get me a tiny bit of water? James, could you get me a tiny bit of water? Okay, so now I have turned on. Kids, don't do this at home. I think because I'm using gluten-free flour, I needed a little bit more liquid. Okay. Okay. So 
So I think that's good. And I'm just heating up my pan. You can use nonstick or whatever. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit of oil. Katrina, feel free to ask questions while I'm doing this. Oh, great. Okay, we did have a question um, from a few people, aside from wanting the recipes, which, yes, guys, we will email you um, both of the recipes that Hudging has, uh, has provided to us um, after the end of the program, so you will be receiving that soon, um, so please don't worry. Uh, we question, um, Daphne asks, do the dried chili peppers grow ba go bad or just lose flavor over time? Uh, the previous dish. The dried chili peppers... They don't go bad. They will oxidize over time. I find that if they get older, the chili flakes will look darker instead of a bright red. Um, so yes, they'll lose flavor over time, just like any spices. So as you can see, I'm making kind of small pancakes. Um, oftentimes, Koreans will make a big plate-sized pancake, and then they'll just kind of tear it up and share it. Um, I like making these small ones because you get more crunchy edge um, and they're more individual friendly. And then you just let it sit and cook for about a minute. Any other questions? About the cucumber salad, um, Joelle is asking, can we substitute with a um, sugar alternative like Swerve? And what kind of vinegar can they use? Uh, you can use just regular white vinegar, uh, you know, rice vinegar would be optimal. Um, and yes, you don't, I would, uh, yeah, you could use swerve, but you could also use honey. Um, yeah, it's just a very minimal amount of sweetness so that, you know, it's not just salty tangy, it's salty sweet tangy. Okay, so just like any pancakes, when you see the edge, getting dry, that's when you flip it. So the first one, the second one, and the third one needs a little bit longer. So you cook it, you know, maybe about a minute on each side. And uh, you don't need a lot of oil, but I have to say they will be kind of crunchier, crispier on the edges if you do use some amount of oil. And then, so as I said previously, you know, these, you will see these uh, kind of pancakes on menus, uh, but the reason why you see them on menus is because they're a treat. Your mom doesn't have time to make all these pancakes all the time. So you're either waiting for a rainy day or going out to a restaurant <laughs> to eat these pancakes. And they're often eaten as a snack, not as part of the meal. Um, and so, yeah, these would be a good little anju too, something to eat with your um, your soju, your beer, et cetera. Oh, that looks good. You see how nice and brown that looks because I added extra oil to this side? Okay. And then, so now I'm gonna put my handy dandy little glove back on and let's finish our cucumber salad while so I'm just going to drain the water. So that's salty water. And then I'm going to put, so we've got maybe a tablespoon of water. If you let it sit longer, more water is going to come out. I'm going to put the pancakes. So there is a dipping sauce that when you see the directions that are given in the recipe, you can make that dipping sauce and dip the pancakes into that. I'm not making the dipping sauce today because I'm making this cucumber salad and that's gonna be kind of our condiment. So here's the salad and here is the, the seasoning that we put together earlier. Oh, it smells so good. And so I'm I'm doing I'm doing that thing called muchida mucho to you know mix together and season with your hands. 
So um, you probably want to, after you make this, let it sit for 15 minutes or so so that the flavors of the seasoning can go into the cucumbers. But I'm going to taste it right now and see what I think. Mm. <laughs> Right now it's a little on the salty side. I'm gonna add a little bit more vinegar and like a pinch more sugar. The uh, That bag of kochukaru I bought was for some reason super spicy, so I don't think I need to add any more. This is just one teaspoon of kochukaru. And then, yeah. And so, you know, you can make it more spicy or more salty or more tangy, depending on your taste. But anyway, I think this is going to be a nice little snack for me and my husband. Um, uh, oi, oi sengche and uh, kimchi pancakes. Any other questions? Well, we, there's lots of comments that that looks at. Delicious. Uh, yes, uh, lunchtime is rolling around, so I think we're all very hungry. <laughs> but we do have a lot of questions for you. Um, I don't know if we'll have enough time to answer everything, uh, but let's try and go through as many questions as we can for Ha Jung. Uh, let's see. Are there? Well, someone is wondering. Do you have any tips on building tolerance to eating spicy foods? Um. I would say if you want to build your tolerance, yeah, just keep eating spicy foods um, a little bit at a time. And, and you really do build a tolerance. When I lived in Korea for about five or six years in the early 90s, I really built a tolerance and could eat super spicy food. I My tolerance is, you know, maybe half that now. Just keep trying. Oh, also... Um, one trick I learned is that the um, this feeling of spicy burning uh, can be mitigated. Like if something is super spicy to you, don't drink water after it. Eat something that has some fat in it. So, you know, like that's why we might have like uh, some cheese in our enchiladas or something like that, because the, the, the fattiness of the cheese helps tone down the spiciness of the, uh, the salsa. Also, people are wondering, do you recommend any good uh, banchan restaurants in the Los Angeles area for homestuck banchan? Um, my favorite restaurant for banchan is um, Seongbukdong on 6th Street and Catalina. The lady who owns the restaurant also works in the kitchen and she is a great cook and they always yeah give very home style panchan made with love and um they have really great um they're known i think for their um uh, rib their braised ribs and they have this kimchi and braised fish dish that's very I think very Korean, maybe Americans would not really be so much into it, but using this really old fermented kimchi, great bunch of Can you say the name of that restaurant one more time for our audience? Songbukdong. I think it's spelled S-E-O-N-G-B-U-K-D-O-N-G. Songbukdong is a neighborhood in Seoul. Seoul, and it's actually where my parents lived before we immigrated to the U.S. So um, there's also a, I have a soft place in my heart for that name. <laughs> and also, there's so many people interested in following you and your work, and very interested in your um, any other cooking workshops that you might be putting on. Um, do you have uh, someone even asked if you give food tours in L.A. or even in South Korea? And how can we keep up with you? Are you members of any? Are you a member of any local organizations that we can follow? Uh, well, I am uh, a member of the Culinary Historians of Southern California, and I gave a talk about kimchi to them last November. Hopefully, in the future, I will give more talks with them. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Hejung's Kimchi Club on Facebook, uh, and yes, I do give uh, food tours and I do cooking classes. Um, 
I've not done a food tour to Korea yet, but that is a dream of mine once we can travel again. Um, and uh, let's see, you, you can email me also at uh, hjc90026 at yahoo.com. If you want to inquire about cooking classes, I can do in person once I get vaccinated next week, um, but also over Zoom, we can do cooking classes. And it's really fun to do like a kimchi class with a small group of people because that's the way Korean people would have been doing kimchi anyway. You get together with your relatives and your neighbors and you chat and have snacks and you sing. Um, and after you're done, you can, you know, have some soju or makgeolli. Oh, that's, that's great. And we definitely want to have you back for presentations with LA County Library once everything um, settles down. We, hopefully we can have Hajjung in for in-person uh, programs, but also maybe virtual ones again in the future. Um, but yes, everyone is very interested to keep up with Hajjung. Can you um, say your email address again? My email address is hjc90026 at yahoo.com. And yes, I will answer any of your questions about what's the best restaurant for this or that, or where to buy rice cakes for your child's, you know, dol or, and, and I love showing people around LA and, you know, around Koreatown. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. Oh, oh, it was a pleasure having you. We've also linked um, Hedman's uh, Facebook page, her Kimchi Club. So Connect with her there online as well. But thank you so much again, Hajung, for this wonderful, lovely presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us.